10 Minute Jazz Lesson Podcast, episode 320. Hey everybody, welcome back to episode 320 of the 10 Minute Jazz Lesson Podcast. If you're new to the show, welcome in, and to everybody else, welcome back. It's the third week of the month, so you know what that means. We are doing our Lick of the Month, and this month it's actually Chorus of the Month because I could not manage to trim down Wynton Marsalis's insanely good playing. But before we jump into the show, the meat of the episode, just wanted to remind you this is a listener-supported podcast, which means we do not do any advertising on the show except for this quick one. Instead, we rely on listeners like you to support the show with a small monthly donation. In return for that monthly donation, you do get a PDF with every episode and audio examples to help you along your jazz education journey. So if you would like to become a supporter of the show and you're not already, go to our website, 10minutejazzlesson.com, click on one of the Patreon banners, and that will bring you over, explain all the different levels of support and what you get with each one of them. Wanted to give a quick shout out to some brand new patrons this week. Thank you to our new $5 patrons, Stephen, Richard, and Arild. And thank you to Swilly for editing your pledge from $3 up to $5. And we've also got some new $3 patrons. Thank you to Vincent, Johannes, and Nuno. Thank you all so much for becoming part of the 10 Minute Jazz Lesson family and to the over 350 people that we have over there supporting us. Thank you. We could not do this without you. So again, 10minutejazzlesson.com. Click on one of the Patreon banners. Get yourself signed up today. All right, let's jump into the episode. So this material comes from this great, great YouTube video of Wynton Marsalis from 2013. It is a live performance of him playing duo with just a tuba player. So it's a pretty fantastic watch. I will make sure to put the link to that YouTube video in the show notes. Now, it's a little bit confusing the title of this, right? So the title of the video is Buddy Bolden's Blues, but there's a lot of controversy in the comments. Apparently, this song is not really called Buddy Bolden's Blues, but instead the melody came from a 1943 recording by Bunk Johnson called Making Runs. So regardless of what it's actually called, it is a fantastic example of jazz improvisation and the genius and amazing playing of Wynton Marsalis. Now, the first thing you will notice is this is not a blues. It's actually a 32 bar form, and it's a very, very traditional set of changes that actually belong to a lot of different tunes. It's very, very simple. There's not much to it, but let's go over the form real quick, even though most of you would probably be able to analyze this and figure out what's going on basically right away. Okay, so it's in the key of concert B flat. And we see the tune start out with six bars of B flat six. Then we go to the five chord. And then it hangs out on that five chord for a really long time, actually, eight bars. And then we see it resolve back to B flat six. And that's the entire first half of the tune. That's the first 16 bars. So now jumping to measure 17, we're still on that B flat six chord. We get five bars of that. Now that one chord becomes the five of four. And then we modulate to the four. So E flat six. Then we do this very, very common chord progression that's found in a lot of these traditional tunes. We go four, to minor four, back to one, to six, five of five, to five, to one. So extremely, extremely simple progression. One of the tougher parts about this progression is keeping track of all those bars where it's the same chord. But the more that you hear this, the better you'll get at it. All right, so as I mentioned, this is an entire chorus of his playing. So let's check out a little example of me 
playing this. I don't hold the candle to the way that Witten does, so I suggest you go and check out the original recording after you're done listening to this episode. But here is my rendition of what he is playing. Now, I did have to displace octaves a couple times because this is a trumpet transcription, and it doesn't always fit neatly into the range of the tenor saxophone. So if you're following along, you will notice that I did that. All right, here's his solo. So what a fantastic statement, right? 32 bars that could just stand on their own and contain so much fascinating material. So there's a couple of spots that I would like to highlight. The first spot is measure seven. I really want you to study what Winton has done when it finally goes to the five chord. First of all, how does he lead into measure seven? And then what does he do to highlight the fact that the harmony has finally, finally changed to that five chord? There's a chromatic approach in there, a couple of them. And I just think that that outlining of the harmony changing is one of the coolest parts of this entire solo, okay? So now I would like to skip down to the very, very, very end. Of course, there's a bunch of fantastic material in between where I just mentioned and where I'm about to mention, but you can look at that on your own. You can uh, come to some of your own conclusions. Um, if I went through every single measure in this, this podcast would last forever. So I'm gonna skip to my second uh, most favorite part. So if we go down to 25, we are going to notice that 25 through 28, he starts doing something really interesting. The harmony is playing off this four to minor four back to one, and then it's starting the turnaround to the end of the form. But what Wynn does that I think is really, really interesting is he's just playing the blues across all all of these bars. And in his mind, what I would guess is that he's actually just thinking B flat. Now, this is a great lesson for all of us, especially me, because when I get to that part of a progression, what I tend to do is I really try to outline every chord, and I always forget that I don't have to do that every time. It might be cool to do it at certain points in my solo if it calls for it, but what Wynn does here is he just reminds me, hey, you can just play the blues and that will fit over all of this. What he's really doing is he's playing a B flat uh, pentatonic scale, major pentatonic scale, but he's inserting that minor third, which we have talked about so much here. And that really connotates this blues feeling. So then as he gets into measure 28 through the end, he's really doing some very, very cool stuff, particularly with the rhythm. You're going to notice a lot of these quarter note triplets. And I want to also mention that the quarter note triplets are just an approximation of what he's playing. He's really not playing any rhythm that you can write down. He's manipulating the time in such a way that he's laying it back, pushing it forward, creating this really, really cool effect that's basically impossible to write down on paper. So this is what I've done to make it as close as possible to what I hear. But again, it all goes back to the original recording. So make sure you check that out. But look at what he's doing. He's playing these upper chromatic notes, so concert E flat to E to F, and then back down. And then the lower note is always a concert F, right? So he's playing off of this chromatic line, ascending and descending, with a constant concert F on the bottom. And that combined with the rhythm makes it one of the 
coolest parts of this entire chorus, if not the coolest part. So that should be some inspiration to you on how to get that particular kind of feeling. Again, it's a very, very bluesy kind of feeling that he presents to us at the end of the chorus here. So those are my two favorite parts. I'm sure a lot of you will find other parts that you absolutely fall in love with, but I think that this is just such a great 32 bar statement. It's melodic, it's simple, while also being extremely slick. And one of the things that I appreciate about Winton's playing so much is that the melody is always the most important thing. It's not about following the changes exactly, 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 although he does do that at some times if it serves the melody, but Winton just always has the strongest, strongest sense of playing a melody and phrasing in such a way that the melody is paramount over the chord changes. There's no outlining of the harmony just to be outlining it. He does not need to do that. So that is something that I took away from this along with those two specific spots. Let me know what are some of the things that you took away from this. I hope you enjoy this. Um, everybody that is signed up for Patreon is going to get the PDF of the transcription. The $5 members will get that backing track of bass only that you heard me play over so that you can go and play this yourself. But again, try to play along with Winton as well. Try to master his time, everything that he's doing. That is where you're gonna get the most benefit out of this. So remember, if you wanna grab the PDF and the audio examples, make sure to go to 10minutejazzlesson.com, click on one of the Patreon banners, get yourself signed up today for instant access to all of that material. Gonna play it one more time for you here at the end. Hope you're all doing well and staying safe and healthy. And I hope you all have a great weekend. We'll see you next week with another episode. Bye everybody.